All right, everybody, good morning, and welcome to the Breakwater Church. Uh, as you can tell, Kurt Dolan is not here today, Pastor Kurt. He's on his way to Africa. I think he left last night at about 11 o'clock, so he should be there shortly. So we're waiting for confirmation that he landed. I think he's going to London first, so we'll see him there. Um, so with that said, we're going to have a guest speaker, Randy Bolt. He's right here, a uh, local person. <laughs> I'll read a, a little bio that he sent. <laughs> so Randy was a lead pastor for 40 years in the, South, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's since retired, and here in the local area in South Bay, where he grew up, uh, for retirement. He, I just talked talk to him. He went to Torrance High, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> I went to North, so, so welcome. Uh, my West High Aviation? Okay. Really local. <laughs> uh, he now serves, he serves and oversees for the four square churches in our region, regularly teaches this discipleship uh, training schools for YWAM, Youth with a Mission, in Asia, and produces Bible teaching content distributed through social media and his website. He and his wife, Sue, has been married for 48 years. They have three children and seven grandchildren. Congratulations. Yeah. Awesome. So with that said, we'll do a quick prayer and we'll get started. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Uh, we pray for today, Father, that our guest speaker gives us the words from you. That we open our hearts and our minds to listen to his words, Father, and to put them towards our life in the daily week coming up. Uh, Father, we lift up Pastor Kurt and the team that's flying to Africa today. We pray for good health. Uh, we pray you bless them and watch over them. Keep them healthy and safe, Father, and bring them home. And we just pray that you bless everyone that they touch and that they come to see you, Lord. And uh, we just give you thanks for everything that you've done for us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
God be the glory.
God, we thank you that God, you are always with us and that we can just call on you and you come and you answer our prayers. And we thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, even in our weakness. It says you, your strength in you were made strong. So I just thank you, Father, for that grace. And I pray that you would just bless us this morning as we hear from um, Pastor. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus.
Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to be with you, the welcome that we've already received. It's, you know, you're supposed to say this when you're a guest, that it's a, a delight and a privilege to be with a group like this. And so I just said it, but I didn't say that because I'm supposed to. I said that because I mean it. I have, uh, my wife and I have had the, the privilege in our retirement to be able to serve the local churches in our uh, South Bay and West LA area for the Four Square Church. Uh, as overseers, and um, uh, we've been uh, delighted to be getting acquainted with your pastors, Kurt and Irma, and about a month or so ago, you may, if you, you may recall, Mother's Day, my wife was invited to speak here, and so that was our first chance to actually be on site, and it was great to get acquainted with you, and delighted to be able to be back with you today. I'd like to ask you to get a hold of your Bible and get it open to, uh, or turned on as the case may be, um, to Luke chapter 11 if you have a paper uh, analog Bible like this uh, and not sure where the Gospel of Luke is. Uh, there's this great thing right at the front of the, of the Bible that's called the Table of Contents. It'll help you get there pretty quickly. Uh, if you're using a Bible app on your phone or some other digital device, you're on your own. But get to Luke chapter 11, and I'll be reading out of the New King James Version, so if you've got an electronic version of the Bible and can select that version, it'll help you to be able to follow along a little better. But today I want to talk to you about prayer, and uh, some of you, when I said that just now, decided, okay, I'm going to start to think about what I'm going to have for lunch, because a lot of us, well, I'll just, I'll just say that the way it is. All of us who have decided that we want to be Christ followers understand that prayer is an important thing. How many of you would agree to that? Prayer is an important thing. Look, if I'm going to be a Christ follower, I've got to learn how to pray. And every one of us who just raised our hands a minute ago know that we do a very bad job of it. And we carry, a lot of us carry a lot of... Uh, guilt about how little or how ineffective we are in our prayer lives. And so for me to bring it up this morning uh, would is, for some of us, a little painful. Please don't check out on me. Come back. Come back. And let's listen to what Jesus has to say to his disciples about the subject of prayer. And I think you're going to find that some of the things that, that we carry with us in terms of with regard to prayer the Lord might want to just lift that today and help us find uh, the joy of being connected with him in this ongoing conversation. All right, so let me pray real quick. And, uh, and actually, it may not be real quick, but we'll see. Anyway, I want us pray and invite the Lord's Spirit to guide us in his word this morning. Father, I do come before you thankful that you have invited us to know you and to be in relationship with you. And that a huge part of that engagement of relationship is all about prayer and, and conversing with you, hearing from you, to get, bearing our hearts before you. I pray that in these, in these moments that we have this morning that you would illuminate your word in a way that invites us deeper into that relationship. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I do have, let me, let me see if this thing's, oh, there we go. So I want to invite you to pray. And I'm going to start reading in chapter 11 of the Gospel of Luke at verse 11. And the first part of this, actually the whole section that we're going to read, uh, and it's, it's fairly lengthy. I'm going to take you, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to take you through verse 13. And just so you, I'm, I'm warning you, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about every, every part of this, but I want to get the flow of this passage in your hearts and minds and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us through it. And a lot of it will be very familiar to you, especially the first part, because uh, you can't get very far in life without encountering what we uh, often describe as the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, see, there you go. And uh, I, I want to read it, not that we're going to deal with that, but because we're going to talk about what comes right after that. But I want you to see the flow. I want you to catch that what the, the section that we're going to focus on today comes right on the heels of the Lord that we, we uh, uh, refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Here we go. Verse 1, chapter 11 of the Gospel of Luke. Now it came to pass, as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, 
Teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. Let me just stop right there for a minute and say, you know, this is how this went down. A lot of us think that the Lord's Prayer or his instruction to the disciples about praying, which, you know, I think you'd be aware of the fact that when we, uh, pr when we read or pray that prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc., he wasn't giving them a, pr uh, a rote, a prayer to, to recite by memorization. He was inviting them to uh, embrace this model of praying. He was giving them a, an outline for prayer. But a lot of us, I think, have the idea that Jesus got his disciples together and said, all right, guys, you need to learn how to pray because this is really important. But that's not how it went down. We just read that Jesus was off by himself praying to the Father. And can you imagine the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, communing with God the Father in prayer? And his disciples are overhearing this. They're observing this. How amazing would that have been to be one of the disciples and, and see that, to experience it, to, to um, get a sense of that depth of that relationship that is indescribable. And when Jesus finished praying, they said to him, oh, Lord, teach us how to do that. Because what we've experienced in the synagogue and in the temple and our religious elite and the leaders, when they pray, it's not like that. Show us how to do that. And I think that most of us as Christ followers, and I imagine that you're here today because you would include yourself in that group, want to know how to do that. So Jesus gives them this outline. Let's pick up again at verse 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, we could spend literally weeks on these few verses here. It's so deep, so rich, uh, and I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you and say, thank God. All right. Uh, verse 5. Because I want you to see, though, that what happens now follows right after that. This is seamless. This is Jesus moving from this outline of prayer to this kind of new subject. And so uh, there's no break here. He said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend? And please note how many times the word friend is used in this section. Uh, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you. Though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, I think that there's a lot of us who um, have encountered this section before. I know my first encounter with this passage was as a young uh, kid growing up in church in Sunday school class. And uh, our Sunday school teachers love to teach parables from, from Jesus' parables because they're stories that are relatable. Uh, and so I think that's how it first was presented to me, that this is a parable. 
But I want you to consider that this isn't a parable at all. This is something else. I'll explain in just a minute. But let me just explain what a parable is. So a parable is not a riddle. <laughs> it's not, sometimes we get this idea from the way people have described things that Jesus had to say as though he wanted to confuse people. So he spoke in parables or riddles so that you really had to work to kind of figure out what he was saying. That's not the case at all. In fact, exactly the opposite. A parable is Jesus saying, all right, let me, I need to introduce you to something you don't yet know something you haven't yet understood, and I'm going to talk to you about something you already know that will point you there. So I'm going to lay something in parallel alongside truth, a story that you'd be familiar with alongside truth so that it, you can move from what you do know to what you don't yet know. That's what a parable is. It's like when I went to Disneyland the other day. Our, my, my wife and I we went to Disneyland a few weeks ago with one of our grandsons who'd never been there. And I don't know if you're familiar with the ride in California Adventure called Soaring, but he asked us, he said, so what's it like? Because we, we were standing in line to go on it. What's it like? I said, well, I don't know how you would describe it. I said, it's like sitting in a swing and watching a movie. <laughs> now, it's not quite that, but it was, I was giving him a parable. I was giving him something he could relate to, something he would understand and know, so that he could, so we could build a bridge, hopefully, to what he didn't yet know and what he would experience when we got in there. When Jesus told parables, that was what he was doing. He was saying, this is what it's like. That's what a parable is. That's not what this is. And the reason that's important to understand is because a lot of us have come away with the idea, I certainly did, growing up in church, I was convinced on the basis of what my Sunday school teachers told me from this, quote, parable, that if I wanted anything from God, I really had to pester him. I had to be persistent. I had to really bang on the door of heaven to try to get God to do something from me. And if I wasn't prepared to really go after it like that, well, I might as well not even try. That's the message I got. Now, I'm not, sh I'm not certain that that's what they intended for me to walk away with, but that's what I got. That we have a God in heaven who you really, really have to work to get him to get, to, to get his attention. But I want you to notice something that I discovered when I read through this a few years ago, that at the end of verse 7, there's a punctuation mark. Now, I, I'm aware of the fact that in ancient Greek, when, which is the, the language that the, the New Testament is, our English New Testament is translated from, that they didn't have punctuation mar marks. Uh, but the, the reason that it's included here in our English translation is because the language is a question. And that's what you see there at the end of verse 7, a question mark. Jesus wasn't giving us a parable. He wasn't telling us, this is what God is like. Let me tell you this story about this idiot who wouldn't help his friend in the middle of the night. And, and now, let me tell you, this is what God is like. That's not what Jesus was doing. He said, how many of you have a friend, a friend? And another friend would come to you in the middle of the night. Didn't, didn't, he's traveled a long way. He's hungry. You don't have anything to feed him. So you go to your friend, and you knock on his door and say, hey, friend, could you loan me some loaves? And that guy will say, it's too late. I've already closed the door. My kids are in bed. Go on. How many of you have a friend like that? What's the answer to that question? No one. No one. Do you have a friend who would act like that? Well, maybe you are that friend, though. I don't know, but anyway. I mean, I think this, the, the, all of us can understand that Jesus was giving us something that was so absurd that we would understand God is not like this. But how many of us have these ideas about God that are, if we're honest with ourselves, or he's kind of like that. Jesus said, no, no, no. He says this, and it pains me to even hear the Lord say this. He says, this guy, this creep, who wouldn't come to your aid in the middle of the night, who you call a friend, 
even this guy will give you what you ask if you pester him. But God is not like that. And you can tell from the flow of the passage that we read that Jesus goes on and makes a, a clear case for what God is really like. And that's what I want to spend some time with you today talking about. Now, there's definitely a, a lesson to be learned here about uh, the importance of being persistent in prayer, but that's not the subject. That's not what's being said here. I want you to see, first of all, that Jesus tells his disciples, and hopefully this will work, yeah, that Jesus tells his disciples that when we pray, we come to one who is not behind a closed door. A lot of times we have this idea that, or we have a kind of a subconscious, somehow it's worked its way into the back recesses of our thoughts about God, that there's sort of a combination lock on, on his door that we kind of have to work out, you know. Change our tone of voice, or our posture, or the word, or quote scripture somehow, or do something that sort of unlocks God's door and we can get through. I mean, when I say it now, we all realize that's, that's silly. But we act like that. We, we, we approach God in prayer like that, that there's something that we're just not quite getting. Maybe we need to pray longer. Maybe we need to get on our knees you know, somehow. But we don't have that, God. In fact, the Bible says if there's any door that's locked, it's on our side of things. Revelation 3.20 says, Jesus is saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any of you will open the door and let me in, I'll come in and, and have sup, I'll sup with you. I'll have, I'll have a meal with you. I want to be with you. There is God, our God, the one we approach in prayer is not behind a closed door. In fact, verse 9, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you for everyone. I don't know if you've got a pen or a highlighter, but that would be a really, and well, it's hard. To, you can highlight an electronic uh, Bible, but you know, if you've got a good old one of these, mark it up, underline that word, Everyone, everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds to him who knocks it will be opened. When we come to God in prayer, we come to one who is not requiring persuasion. We don't need to make, make a case. You know, so how many of you have kids or grandchildren? Grandchildren. Well, I guess you can't really have grandchildren if you don't have kids, so I shouldn't have said that, but anyway. Um, all right, so there's a bunch of us. We, you've all had the experience where your, your child comes to you and says, I know you're going to say no, but, but let me explain to you why you should say yes, right? And we do that with God, or we imagine ourselves relating to God that way, that somehow he needs to be persuaded to do what we want to see him do. We don't have that God. In fact, in Matthew 6, verse 8, it says that he knows what we need before we ask. And think about that for a minute. That can only be true if he cares about what we need, knows what we need before we do. Because the, I don't know about you, but the minute I know what I need, I'm asking. <laughs> and it says there that he knows what I need before I ask. He doesn't need our persuasion. In fact, how silly is it to even think that the God who knows everything that can be known could somehow be informed by you or me? God, just in case it's not on your radar, let me just uh, inform you that my, my sister Jenny needs your help right now. God knows. He already knows. 
and he already can. Can you imagine the, f the foolishness of thinking we could somehow motivate God beyond what he's already engaged in? But don't we pray like that sometimes? We pray like we need to sort of inform him or motivate him or persuade him. We don't have that God. When we come to God in prayer, we come to one who is not wearied by our requests. You know, this guy, you had to somehow, you know, the, 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 the friend, quote, quote, who wouldn't come to, to his, his friend's assistance had to be persuaded and he had to be worn down. He had to be uh, the, the uh, protagonist in the story, had to weary his friend to help. We don't, we don't have that God. We don't come to one who is wearied by our requests. There's no quota. Think about that for a minute. He's not like, not like uh, Aladdin's genie, where you get three wishes. I, you know, we, I, I've been in situations where I've had to bring what seems to me to be the same thing over and over and over to God, and some of you have too. And where we are, we are often thinking that God's. Uh, silence is because he either doesn't hear or doesn't care, and neither of those are true. There are other reasons why we may need to persist in prayer, and that's what I said earlier about why there is a lesson about that here for us to understand. But it's not because God is wearied by our requests. It's not because we've somehow, um, you know, the, the, we've, we've uh, exceeded our limit. It's not like your phone when you run out of minutes, you know. We have a God in heaven who is not wearied by our requests. And then we, when we pray, when we go to God in prayer, we don't come to one who, who should be feared. We come to one who is not to be feared. And what I mean by that is Jesus says, if a son, in verse 11, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? And a lot of times, Christians, they have this sort of subtle fear that if they come to God asking for bread, what they're going to get is a stone. That somehow... God's plans or God's will or God's desires are going to be less than what we want to see happen or what we think should happen. And so, you know, we're sort of braced for either the no answer or an answer that isn't, doesn't seem to fit our desires. You know, uh, when I was uh, 19, or actually not quite 19, my wife and I got married when we were just 19. Yeah, yeah. But 48 years later, here we still are. So hallelujah for that. So I was almost, uh, almost 19. I went to her father. His name is Pat, uh, or was. He passed away a few years ago. I, I, I said to him, Pat, sir, I'd like your permission to marry your daughter. And you know what his answer was? No. Yeah. And he said, yeah, I, I, you know, I want, you're, you're uh, in Bible college, you're going to become a minister. I am not certain that you're not going to be living in a grass hut somewhere with no shoes. I don't want my daughter to be married to a minister. I want her to be married to an orthodontist. <laughs> he had this all worked out. Now, that's, that shocked me. You know, I, I, I was certain that when I asked, finally got up the courage and asked this question, that he's going to say, oh, I'm so grateful you, you asked. I was hoping that you would ask me for 
permission to marry my, da my daughter. I can't imagine anybody who uh, I would prefer to be her husband. That's not what happened. And uh, you know, eventually we wore him down and you know, we got married. But we tend to think, we tend to be afraid of the answer we might get from God. Don't we? Or maybe it's, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one. But there are times I don't engage with God about something that's important in my life or important in the lives of, of people that I know and love with the hope or the desire or the, the faith that he's going to come through in a big and powerful and beautiful way. But we have this promise. And Jesus repeats it in three different ways, three, but three times basically saying the same thing. If you ask for bread from any father among you, if you came to your father and you asked for bread, is he going to give you a rock, a stone? If you ask for a fish, he's going to give you a serpent. If you ask, if you ask for an egg, will he give you a scorpion? The answer is no. He says, if you then being evil, that's me, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And that brings me to the last of the things I want to point out out of this chapter. And certainly this is not an exhaustive, uh, or of this section, this certainly is not an exhaustive um, teaching on this subject. But the last thing I'd like for you to consider with regard to this passage that we read is that when we pray, we come to one who is the answer. You read this and it says, okay, so if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much, will your how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And my thought was, well, who's talking about the Holy Spirit here? Why did that come? How, how does that, how, why is that here? Why did he say that? Because prayer is not about what we need. It's about the one we need. Always. It's not that and God, uh, Jesus has been clear. This is red ink in a red, in a red letter Bible because Jesus is speaking. Jesus is clear that God cares about the things we need. He's not indifferent in any way to our needs. But ultimately, it's not about those things. We think we need a job. We need a spouse. I already have one of those, so that doesn't apply to me. We need healing, etc. We, we think we need this to happen or this to be provided. We, we focus on that. But what we really need is more of him. That doesn't mean that he isn't interested in, in providing the job or the information or the guidance or the house or the whatever. He's, it's not that he isn't interested and won't do those things. But more than all of that, prayer is always about a relationship with him. It's always meant to point us back to him. So he says... If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Because if God is not behind a closed door so that we don't have to fight for his attention, if he's not requiring persuasion, so there's no need to motivate him to care or to attempt to, if he's not wearied by requests, so we don't have to worry about bothering him, and if we don't have to fear how he will answer so we can trust him with the outcome, it frees us to simply desire more of his spirit. It puts to rest all of our all of our longings and all of our concerns and all of our agitations and doesn't it? 
to know that we can safely trust in a God who is not like this character, then we can just come to him for who he is. And that's the point. I'd like to pray for you as I close. And let's just invite the Holy Spirit to perhaps take some of his, of his word to date and reshape our thinking about how we approach this God we do have. Okay? Father in heaven, thank you for answering our prayers as we began to open your word today. I believe, Lord, that you did do what we asked and by your spirit illuminated your word in a way that would help us to get more of a sense of who you're really, what you're really like, who you really are. And may it be, Lord, that as we leave this time and this place today, that the nature of how we relate to you, how we pray to you, how we approach you, will be transformed. And that, Lord, we will find in you the Father that is described in these verses, that you described for us in these verses, the one who is not behind a closed door, one who is not requiring persuasion, one who is not wearied by request, one who is not to be feared, and who is the answer to every need. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.
else, right? He lives within each of us, and, and he's executing his power and his strength in each of us this morning as we sing our praises to him. So we just thank you, God, for that, that you have given us the power within each of us to um, show your love, show your light, and your strength. And we thank you that as we praise you and we make your name known on this earth, that your power is seen through us. And we thank you for that, God, through the power of, your, of Jesus, resurrection. We thank you for that, Lord.